So our next uh, speaker for the evening in the new work in the Theory of Mind Graduate Conference and our uh, keynote for today is Professor Sean Gallagher. He's from uh, the University of Memphis and associate at the University of Wollongong. It's a pleasure to, to be able to meet and introduce Sean. Uh, I see that he's also affiliate of the National Science Foundation. Uh, nobody's perfect. And uh, we're <laughs> delighted we're delighted to have um, his uh, talk today. Uh, before we get to uh, Sean, uh, we've got a brief intro of his from Sandra. Please go ahead. So it's my honor and privilege to introduce Professor Gallagher. He's a Lillian and Mori Moss Professor of Excellence in Philosophy at the University of Memphis. His research um, in areas include phenomenology and the cognitive sciences, especially topics related to embodiment, um, intersubjectivity, hermeneutics, and he is best known for his interaction um, theory. So I'll just, um, I look forward to your talk and you have the floor. Thank you so much for no, thank you. this talk. Thank you very much. Okay. And let me just, minimize this part here okay and yeah, just so, in case you're wondering about the whole intro uh thing uh, everybody here is quite acquainted with your work but uh there will be a number of um uh, undergrad students watching this on youtube in uh, retrospect so this is a uh this is for their benefit as well thanks so much back okay. to the garden interaction in the wild with sean go ahead yeah okay thanks thanks very much and uh let me yeah so let me start with uh just pointing to uh, J.L. Austin here, um, who uh, in his philosophical uh, papers uh, suggests that framing social cognition in terms of the problem of other minds, as it's traditionally been defined, and as found in standard uh, theory of mind approaches, um, he suggests by doing so, we step further away from what he calls the garden of the world we live in. And that's, I'm taking my, the title uh, then from, from this. Uh, we have to, you know, the idea is ha we have to get back into the garden uh, in some way. So here's an outline of uh, what I'll try to get through. Uh, I'll start by considering the origins of the theory of mind, and that'll be in two senses, which I'll clarify. Um, and, and then I will talk a little bit about speech act theory, um, and trying to make speech act theory uh, more embodied. Uh, so those those three parts are more theoretical, uh, but then I'll, I'll turn to some empirical uh, studies, uh, some developmental studies, uh, so that uh, they start out somewhat in the lab, but uh, they, they go a little quasi wild, and I'll explain what that means. Uh, uh, but then ultimately to uh, ethnographic studies in the wild, that is to say, in our everyday life. Uh, and finally, I'll come back to uh, a little bit of a theoretical question about how, you know, about science and, and um, how we conduct it. So first, the origins of theory of mind. The question about the origins of theory of mind can uh, mean different things. Uh, so uh, it can have a number of different answers. Uh, if one assumes that there is such a human capacity described as theory of mind, that is a capacity to mind read uh, or to infer mental states in others, then the question is, uh, where did this capacity come from? Or can we talk about the origins of this capacity? And scientifically, uh, as Nichols and Stitch have suggested in their book, Mind Reading, we can we can look for an answer by starting with evolutionary speculations, uh, which then motivate empirical work in ethology um, and studies in the wild, as uh, for example, from the wall has, has done. And uh, also, of course, in the lab uh, with some famous uh, uh, experiments uh, that we're all familiar with. Um, and this also leads to uh, other studies in developmental psychology and perhaps even psychopathology. Whether you think there is such a uh, theory of mind capacity or not, another way to understand the question about origins is to ask where the concept of theory of mind came from. And in this case, 
the general consensus is to look to some philosophical discussions, but then uh, there is disagreement. Uh, and I say, of course, because philosophy always involves uh, finding disagreements in some way. But here are two interpretations. Uh, the first one uh, is given to us by uh, Ivan Ludar and uh, Alan Kostal, who are psychologists, um, in their 2009 book uh, called Against Theory of Mind. Uh, and they find the roots of theory of mind in Chomsky, who they say uh, gives us the idea of an innate and implicit non-conscious theory uh, as a model of mental capacity. And uh, they also associate it with Grice, who gives us a communicative pragmatics in which an utterance, uh, as they put it, transmits, transfers, or reproduces ready informed psychological states, such as intentions. So they're pointing uh, here to, to Chomsky and, and Grice. There is a point to highlight here. Uh, on this story that they give us, uh, there is a direct link between not just language and theory of mind, but specifically between speech act theory and theory of mind. The direct link um, they, they point out uh, is that Chomsky and Austin met at Harvard when Austin uh, came in 1955 to do his William James lectures. Uh, where he outlined speech act theory. Uh, and uh, as Longworth puts it, Chomsky was immediately sympathetic to central aspects of Austin's thinking about language use and truth. And uh, Ludar and uh, Kosal note that Grice's idea uh, is also transmitted into speech act theory uh, by influencing Searle. Uh, with uh, some change of meaning uh, for Searle, uh, so, so that the, the speaker's intention just is the illocutionary force of the, of the speech act. Uh, and they also note Grice's Thomistic, uh, that's to say, theory of mind uh, 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 view, um, uh, and uh, taken up by his followers, uh, highlighted, uh, for example, um, uh, the, the link bet between speech act theory and theory of mind. So he names Berber and Wilson, Janet Ashington, and uh, Simon Baron Cohen. So Sperber and Wilson um, in, in 2002 equate inference, uh, the inference of communicative intentions to mind reading. So they think that understanding the communicative intentions of the speaker is something equivalent to mind reading. And Janet uh, Assington uh, also says, a social interaction is really an interaction of minds, of mental states, but we have to communicate those states to others. Uh, we share them in language, uh, in the talk that passes between us. So she is also in a certain way linking up theory of mind and speech acts. And Simon Baron Cohen interprets or perhaps misinterprets, it just depends on how you read these things, uh, interprets Grice, Austin, and Searle as arguing in favor of theory of mind. I myself don't think Austin uh, would agree with the, uh, the theory of mind uh, view, but um, he says, such mental state attribution is necessary, it is argued, if a dialogue is to respect the conversational rules of pragmatics. So again, all of these uh, theorists are linking a theory of mind in some way to uh, speech act theory, or could, could be read that way. A second uh, you know, answer to the question about the kind of philosophical origins of the concept of theory of mind um, is a more common account, in fact, uh, that points to the work of Wilford Sellers. And uh, one example of this would be Alvin Goldman, who writes, philosophers began work on theory of mind or folk psychology well before empirical researchers were seriously involved, and their ideas influenced empirical research. In hindsight, one might say that the philosopher Wilful, uh, Wilford Sellers jump-started the field with his seminal essay, Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind. 
Likewise, Nichols and Stitch uh, point to Sellers, uh, although they they rooted through um, his influence on David Lewis. Uh, if, however, Sellers is the sort of philosophical origin of this concept of theory of mind, he fleshes out um, the other question of origins, the first one, uh, about the capacity itself, where does it come from, not with evolutionary speculation, uh, but in fact, he, he just gives us uh, what he calls a myth. But to uh, set the stage properly for, for this, uh, let me go back a little bit uh, to Gilbert Ryle and his concept of mind, which would be 1949, where he famously rejects the Cartesian official doctrine, which includes the idea that the minds of others are hidden away and inaccessible to us. He also rejects, I think, what would become the theory of mind uh, solution. He says, if understanding does not consist in inferring or guessing, the alleged inner life precursors of overt actions, then what is it? If it does not require a mastery of psychological theory together with the ability to apply it, what knowledge does it require? And he suggests that understanding is part of knowing how. The knowledge that is required for understanding intelligent performances of a specific kind is some degree of competence in performances of that kind. And, and therefore, he says, we do not make untestable inferences to any ghostly processes occurring in streams of consciousness, which are debarred, which we're, we are debarred from visiting. And he points out that if we had to depend on making inferences from a knowledge of psychological laws, which he refers to as making a psychological diagnosis in some way, um, if we had to do that in order to understand another's speech or action, we would be led to the paradox that if someone actually knew these laws, uh, they could never explain them to anyone else who also didn't know them. And why is that? Uh, well, he suggests because the other person could not follow your exposition without knowing the laws already and inferring your meaning. Whether that really operates as a real paradox or not, uh, we, we could debate that. Uh, I don't think Sellers takes it to be a, a real paradox. Uh, at least he, he thinks we can solve it if it is a paradox, uh, and he tries to solve it with um, his well-known myth of Jones. In, the, in that essay uh, in 1956, Empiricism and uh, the Philosophy of Mind. And uh, he says, this is a story about, uh, about what we're going to call our Rylian ancestors, who have acquired language, but have no conception of complex mental states. So these proto-Rylians explain human behavior in dispositional terms, for example, someone is angry if they are disposed to ranting and raving and so forth. But then Sellers thinks this, this just doesn't get you very far, it doesn't get you far enough anyway, uh, because humans are capable of much more complicated behaviors. So maybe we can understand very simple behaviors in the way Ryle suggests, but you know, when it gets more complicated, then we need something more. So this is where the myth of Jones uh, comes in, um, who uh, it, he's, it's explained that in, Jones is familiar with language, postulates then the existence of internal language-based or speech-like episodes, which he calls thoughts. Um, and these thoughts are modeled on publicly observable declarative utterances. So in effect, Jones invents folk psychology as a theory that he and his friends can use to explain behavior. And somehow, without encountering Ryle's paradox, he teaches his friends to explain their own behavior by attributing propositional attitudes to themselves. So their own uh, first-person experience is suddenly now populated by beliefs, desires, intentions, and so forth. 
So Sellers here is really explaining uh, in, you know, in a, you know, using this myth idea of how it might be possible to come up with a folk psychology. For Sellers, such attitudes have a functional role, and uh, he makes no ontological claims about them, uh, and he, they are not ghostly ent entities, as Ryle might have uh, claimed. They are, however, networked in complex logical relations of entailment, implication, and uh, inferential dependency. This is folk psychology. Uh, the rational infrastructure of the mind that allows us to predict and explain nuanced behavior. It's not clear that Sellers would go as far as calling this a theory. Uh, he actually says that the, the, the uh, term theory is one of those accordion words, uh, which by their expansion and contraction generates so much philosophical music. Um, so he's not quite happy uh, with that concept. One thing, though, that I want to point to and uh, something I want to highlight is that in setting up folk psychology, Sellers begins with and stays close to the pragmatic realm of speech acts. Um, thoughts being internal language-based or speech-like episodes. So it's we start with speech acts, utterances in the world, and we we in some way internalize that into a kind of inner speech. And this is what thought is. And this is what this is where we get folk psychology from. So he sees something important in the connection between thoughts and speech acts. And he says, as I see it, this story of Jones helps us understand that concepts pertaining to such inner episodes as thoughts are primarily and essentially intersubjective. My myth has shown that the fact that language is essentially an intersubjective achievement and is learned in intersubjective contexts is compatible with the privacy of inner episodes. And he has scare quotes around those, those uh, concepts there. So... Uh, the idea is that folk psychology, uh, as he sort of conceives of it, um, starts out uh, out there in the world in intersubjective relations with others and specifically in speech acts and then gets internalized in some way. Oddly, uh, uh, and if there is a paradox here, I think this is the paradox, to get to a genuine theory of mind, we need to move further away from just those intersubjective contexts that Sellers was talking about, uh, uh, move away from those communicative speech acts and push things further into an interior space of a more sanitized realm of mental events. And here, let me point to uh, uh, a very interesting essay by Rebecca Kukla and Mark Lance, where they scold uh, Sellers on just this point. Uh, and insist that thought is something private and is really not at all speech-like. And, and in doing this, they rightly point out just how situated speech acts are. And they say, the point is that speech acts are the acts they are in virtue of being planted within and constituted by a rich social and institutional context. What speech acts, uh, what speech act I perform and what it accomplishes always depends on how I am situated in social space, whom I am speaking to, and the relation between us. It's not just that speech acts are social interventions, they are robustly social in that we cannot individuate them except through attention to how they are socially situated as transactions between a speaker and an audience who uh, uh, are situated within concrete social institutions that make it possible for speech acts to have particular performative forces. I think this is a very good um, uh, description uh, of some of the uh, ideas involved in speech acts. 
Setting aside the odd thought that the transaction is with an audience, um, they, I don't, don't know why they conceive it that way, uh, Kukla and Lance view such situated transactions uh, quite differently from thinking. Uh, since the rich social and institutional context, they say, cannot be recreated within the privacy of one's mind. Thinking, including believing, inferring, observing, worrying, and so forth, is just not situated in this way. It is not a communicative act, and hence asking about its communicative structure doesn't make sense. There is a huge amount of constitutive structure to speaking that just doesn't have any analog to the level of thinking. So Kukla and Lance really want to draw a strict line between thinking, which is private, and speaking, which is public. And on their view, Sellers failed to notice the profound difference between thinking and speaking, such that he, or Jones in the myth, uh, thought thinking was a kind of inner speech. And they say, doing so seems not to take seriously the concrete social structure and context of the interpersonal transactions that constitute speaking. To act as if there could be some inner analog of this structure and context, or if we can still uh, as if we can still individuate inner speech acts without appeal to the social structure and context, is to miss a deep fact. It is the rich material details, including all the complex power relations between us, the instituted forms of authority, and the long history of sedimented and subtle rituals and conventions that structure a space of possible speech acts uh, with uh, determinant characters. I think uh, Kukla and Lance are absolutely right about speech acts and their descriptions are, are right on. Uh, their characterization, I think, is also perfectly consistent with Austin's view. Speak, speech acts um, are what they are because they are embedded within, as uh, they, they put it, the, uh, 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 embedded within and constituted by a rich social and institutional context. But, of course, Kukla and Lance are just running away. They're running in a, a different direction. Uh, they're running away from the messiness and precarious nature of speech acts, and they're retreating to a pure internal form of thinking, hidden away and unaccessible, and thus in need of a theory of mind. Now, from a more embodied and an activist perspective, uh, I think this is just to take sellers in the wrong direction. This psycho psychologistic version of folk psychology uh, discounts not only the causal uh, role of speech acts, but more generally the role of communicative and narrative practices uh, in our everyday life. On the inactive view, communicative and narrative practices like speech acts do things. They have causal powers. So, uh, I want to stay uh, with this notion of speech acts uh, uh, a bit and actually suggest that we should make it more embodied. Um, although one might think of speech acts as specialized types of speech, as, uh, for example, performatives, as uh, Austin does, uh, he also links speech acts with contextualized action more generally. So we need uh, considerations uh, about who is speaking and in what circumstances. Um, uh, these are important factors that make uh, the utterance a speech act uh, in the sense that Austin uh, intends. As he says, the circumstances in which the words are uttered should be in some way or ways appropriate. And uh, it is very commonly necessary that either the speaker himself or other persons should also perform certain other actions, whether physical or mental actions. So here I want to propose uh, what we might call an, an activist intervention. Um, and I'll give you a kind of timeline uh, for this. In 1955, Austin gave his famous 
William James lectures at Harvard, which we mentioned. Um, a few years later in 1958, Austin went to a meeting uh, at Royal Mall uh, outside of Paris that was organized by Merleau-Ponty. Uh, Austin and Merleau-Ponty meet at that, at that meeting, along with a, a good number of analytic philosophers, mainly from Oxford, um, including Ryle, Quine, A.J. Eyre, P.F. Strawson, Bernard Williams, Arm Hare, uh, and others. Uh, it was quite quite a meeting of continent, what I called continental philosophers versus analytic philosophers. Uh, usually the verses is that they are opposed to one another in some way, but they all met up uh, in 1958 at Royal Mont. Uh, 1960, shortly after that meeting, Austin died of lung cancer. And uh, shortly after that, Merleau Ponty died of lung cancer. Uh, so you can see one difference between continental philosophy and analytic philosophy here. Um, the, the people in Paris were smoking cigarettes. The people in Oxford tended to smoke pipes. But it's sort of the same result. They, they, they all seem to have died of lung cancer, at least in this case. Uh, so then in 1962, just after that, uh, Austin's lectures are published, How to Do Things with Words. Um, the William James Lectures, and that becomes the famous book on speech acts. At Royal Mont, Austin had uh, explained precisely how we do things with words, uh, and Merleau Ponty's intervention uh, uh, that it, it, it is that uh, he would claim that what we do includes thinking. So, as he puts it in the Phenomenology of Perception, which was written in the 1940s, so quite some time before, um, he says, speech accomplishes thought. And his idea here is, is uh, not that there is thinking first, uh, and then uh, I simply express or externalize that thought in a speech act. But his thinking is rather that we, we accomplish our thinking in the utterances that we, uh, uh, that we um, uh, uh, engage with uh, and in our interactions with other people. Um, so thinking, uh, at least for Merleau-Ponty here, isn't just something hidden away in the head. Uh, it is something sort of accomplished in action and in uh, uh, certain kinds of actions that include speech acts. So uh, this is not the same way that we might read Sellers or Jones's idea of speech becoming internalized, but rather going in the other direction, uh, the, uh, it's the idea that thinking originates and is embodied in speech acts uh, to begin with. So if we consider thinking to be a doing and that we can enact such thinking in speaking, uh, this suggests a more general conception of speech acts. So this is uh, overly quick, but the idea I want to propose is that if we think of speaking, more, more generally communicating and thinking as coupled processes involving actions and interactions in social cognitive contexts, then the analysis of speech acts uh, in this admittedly very broad sense, which may include not just speech per se, but also gestures, nonverbal expressions, bodily postures, facial expressions, and so forth, um, generally speaking, communicative acts. Um, so uh, looking at those things can help us characterize social cognitive interaction, which in some cases can be a kind of thinking together. So uh, I want to uh, pursue this uh, uh, by talking about two different directions, uh, looking first at uh, developmental studies, uh, the connections uh, that emerge between speaking, communicating, thinking. Um, the idea is that they are already rooted in even prenatal existence and certainly in, in uh, early infancy. Uh, and then uh, uh, we'll give uh, you an example of an ethnographic study, uh, which uh, gives us further evidence uh, that in children and adults, we can still find uh, these processes uh, uh, of kind of interaction uh, uh, and 
the use of uh, speech acts um, in, in conversational analysis. Uh, and I also want to talk a little bit about uh, method uh, as well um, and, and speak about sp specific methods that we can use in order to analyze such things, uh, coordination dynamics, uh, multimodal uh, quantitative pragmatics. Let me start with the developmental studies, though. Uh, and here we're moving, starting in the lab, but then moving uh, into a more quasi-wild re, uh, region. So uh, as we note, uh, theory of mind typically appeals to the false belief test. And classic false belief experiments are set up, I think, narrowly to, to test mind reading. Um, the child is placed in a third-person observer stance. The question is about the action of the uh, of an observed uh, third person, uh, and the supposition is that the the child understands the action by correctly inferring the other person's belief. Um, it's a good test for theory of mind, uh, but I think it's a bad test for social cognition more generally. Uh, and uh, I said something like this uh, uh, yesterday in a question and answer. Um, off to the side of the experiment, so to speak, there's a kind of a wild component. Um, that is to say, uh, a, a kind of social cognition is ongoing between the child and the experimenter. And that's simply assumed. Uh, that's not what's being studied or tested in this experiment. But it's nonetheless there, such that the, the even the three-year-old or, or younger uh, child seems to understand uh, um, even uh, the experimenter's questions, uh, even if they can't answer the third person task uh, in the right way. So if the first person is the child as test subject, the second person is the experimenter who has no trouble communicating and making herself understood to the child. And the only trouble the three-year-old has is with you know, that task of a third person uh, mind reading. To move uh, a little closer to the wild side, let's say, uh, let's consider speech um, and uh, what some people call proto-speech in the prenatal uh, early infancy context. So prior to birth, uh, the fetus shows sensitivity to the mother's voice. Um, components of speech, uh, such as pitch, rhythm, stress, and some phonetic information can be transmitted through the uterus and uh, at birth, the newborn infant uh, uh, shows a preference for their, their mother's voice. And they uh, can recognize speech samples from stories that were read to them prenatally by their mothers. So this uh, suggests very, very early uh, um, uh, kinds of uh, processes that involve speech in some fashion. So uh, if uh, you, we might call these proto-speech acts, um, infant uh, and caregiver uh, uh, interact with one another uh, in ways that can be characterized by dyadic exchanges of attention, vocalization, and facial expression in what are called proto-conversations. This is uh, Kim uh, Oller, who is uh, actually a, a here in Memphis, a, 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 a colleague here in Memphis, who has studied uh, what he calls protophones, uh, uh, which are, he says, embedded in proto-conversations starting short, shortly after birth. So protophones consist of vocalizations, uh, notably higher than normal range uh, of the infant, so he calls them squeals, uh, vocalizations notably lower than the normal range, or he calls them growls, and also uh, vowel-like vocalizations in mid-pitch mid uh, mid, uh, range, or what he calls vocons. So he does a very kind of uh, specialized and detailed analysis of some of the sounds uh, that, that are involved uh, in, uh, in the interaction between the infant and the caregiver. And it turns out that these uh, intonational units, uh, or primitive precursors of speech, are interactionable, that is to say, during the infant's first three months, caregivers tend to interact with 
uh, the uh, the infants uh, in uh, in terms of the protophones that are being uttered, um, but not with sort of the natural cries. I mean, of course, they do things uh, if if the child starts crying, but they're not in a communicative mode with cries. But they are in a communicative, interactionable mode. Uh, let's say with these uh, uh, protophones, mothers uh, respond in a proto conversational manner to protophones uh, produced by the infant, and there's been studies uh, to show this. This, I think, very nicely fits into the picture of primary intersubjectivity, as it's been outlined by especially Colwyn Trevarthen, but also Vasu Reddy, uh, Peter Hobson, and a number of other people who show the importance of uh, bodily interactions which they, uh, they uh, refer to as primary intersubjectivity, and uh, joint actions in highly contextualized pragmatic situations, which they come to call secondary intersubjectivity. Primary intersubjectivity that was based on observations of quasi-naturalistic ongoing, well, they, that's their term, quasi-naturalistic ongoing face-to-face -face interactions. So we might say we're in the quasi-wild area. Um, and what they do is a, a microanalysis of the videos that infants work with caregivers uh, in very natural settings. So uh, as a recent uh, article by Terence and, and colleagues uh, explain, primary intersubjecti intersubjectivity is the infant's innate ability co to coordinate gaze, vocalization, facial expression, and gesture with those of a parent, for example. Such coordination is identified through correspondences in the, the form, the timing, and the intensity of these behaviors, and uh, the contingencies, uh, the predictable sequences that organize these exchanges. So there is a kind of uh, contingency that is important in uh, this kind of interaction that they're, they're calling primary intersubjectivity. And studies show a kind of bi-directional, although not always symmetrical, uh, contingent coordination between mother, for example, who adjusts more to the infant than the infant adjusts to her. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, there is this kind of bi-directionality uh, where the infant, uh, uh, the facial affect, the vocal affect, the head orientation, and the guy, uh, the gaze are are in fact uh, responding also to the mother. And this has been shown in a number of famous experiments. I won't go into the details of these, but these are uh, uh, experiments where uh, we uh, one can disrupt the contingency in the interaction. So Marion Trevarthin in 1985 uh, used two-way uh, closed caption uh, or closed circuit uh, TV interaction uh, between the mother and the four-month-old infants uh, and when they uh, when when there was a you know it was a live feed of, of the videos um, there is good interaction but when exactly the same uh, video of the mother is replayed um, then the infant although interacting with exactly what they saw before notices that the timing is off, uh, that the contingency is all messed up and and loses it and uh, is not very happy. And something very similar happens in the still face experiments uh, run by Tronic. Uh, and they're pretty famous, so I assume uh, you, you probably know about those. And then in terms of secondary intersubject, uh, intersubjectivity, this emerges around nine months, if not earlier, perhaps as early as four months. Uh, people have have uh, argued. And it includes joint attention. Uh, joint attention refers to the triadic coordination of an infant and her caregiver with objects or events in the immediate environment. It's based on sharing one's attention, uh, feelings, and intentions with regard to external objects. Um, and um, we can find some sophisticated instances of secondary intersubjectivity, uh, things like book sharing where parent and child are sharing picture books accompanied by reading and explanation by the parents pointing at pictures and so forth. 
Uh, and this is a, a form of uh, secondary intersubjectivity. It, it, it involves uh, um, shared attention and kind of shared action as well, a joint action. Here, uh, I think we can easily introduce beyond primary and secondary intersubjectivity the role of communicative and narrative practices that take on more importance as, as uh, we go, uh, uh, as, we, as development uh, uh, unfolds and so forth. Uh, and this is a point uh, Dan Hutto, of course, has made uh, very, very strongly. The overall point here is that from studies of primary and secondary intersubjectivity to studies of communication and narrative practices, we get a picture of complex social cognitive contexts filled with plenty of speech acts, um, all of which I think in a certain sense falls outside of a strict, narrow conception of theory of mind, uh, which is about um, yeah, trying to mind read uh, and so forth. And I think we can see uh, also this very clearly demonstrated when we look at ethnographic studies uh, in the wild, uh, that is to say, studies of our everyday interactions, uh, especially if we're looking at communicative practices in the wild and how they incorporate primary, secondary intersubjectivity, and of course they are involving speech acts. So here I'm just going to point to uh, an example from Charles Goodwin's work uh, and I've uh, I've written about this in a number of places. So uh, if if you're familiar with it, uh, um, just bear with me. And I just want to run through it very quickly to to show exactly what's at stake here. Uh, and Goodwin is doing a kind of conversation analysis, uh, a kind of rich analysis of speech acts that not only express or communicate thought, but constitute thought um, in the way Merleau-Ponty suggested. Um, and we're looking at uh, these things situated in affectively constrained circumstances that involve both embodied aspects, posture, movement, position, and so forth, as well as ecological factors, environmental arrangements, affordances, uh, other persons, and so forth. So this kind of analysis fits very well with sort of 4E cognition, um, if, if you're familiar with that. So Goodwin uh, provides a detailed analysis of a dispute between two young girls, Carla and Diana. And they are playing a game of hopscotch. And what's happening is that one of the, one of the girls is accusing the other girl of cheating. And uh, in, in this setting, there's an, in, uh, an interactive organization of various phenomena. Uh, and Goodwin uh, calls it uh, different kinds of semiotic resources that have to be considered to understand the full encounter. So, for example, spoken language builds signs within the stream of speech, gestures use the body in a particular way, while posture and orientation use the body in another way. And so Goodwin is emphasizing here the visible public deployment of multiple semiotic fields that uh, mutually elaborate each other. And they include, for example, the temporal flow, the rhythm of high versus low, hard versus soft vocal intonation of the speech, some of which has a kind of deontic rather than descriptive force and clearly uh, reflect uh, some of these things clearly reflect various emotional and affective states of the participants. But also it includes a, a set of instituted norms, the rules of the game of hopscotch, for example, which you have to understand to understand what's going on. Also reference to a completed action, um, which was about throwing a marker down on one of the squares. Also, one girl's body intentionality, uh, sorry, uh, her body intentionally uh, moving and standing in the way of the other girl, uh, interrupting the game. Uh, so we have here a kind of embodied intersubjective interaction, a kind of primary intersubjectivity, I think. The bodily orientations of the two girls allowing for eye contact and joint attention towards the hopscotch pattern on the ground. These are also uh, you know, involving temporal modifications in those postures over time, over the, over the, uh, the interaction time. 
Also, there are hand gestures that are dynamically integrated with the speech, uh, but also with the body positions of both girls. So Goodwin describes it as follows. Carla has to use her body in quite a quite precise way while taking into account the visible body of her co-participant. She's faced with the task of using not only her talk, but also her body to structure the local environment such that her gestures can themselves count as forms of social action. So unlike talk, he says, gestures can't be heard. And this means Carla actively works to position her hand gesture so that they will be perceived by Diana. Carla's hand is explicitly positioned in Diana's line of sight, thrusting the gesturing hand towards Diana's face, twists Carla's body into a config uh, configuration in which her hand, uh, her arm, and upper torso uh, are actually leaning in towards Diana. How close is the gesture to the other girl's face? Uh, that proximity has a kind of meaning. It has a kind of intensity to it. Uh, and if it were not a gesture but a touch, then we'd have to ask how hard or soft that touch is, where the touch occurred. Uh, uh, and that also would have some kind of meaning. So the gesture is meant to be attention grabbing, forcing the other girl to orient to the point being made in the speech. Uh, uh, or to a point of joint attention on uh, on something, some object in the environment. And a grab uh, could do the same kind of thing. I think very importantly, this is not one-sided. So the other girl is standing uh, on one foot, attempting to finish her jump through the hopscotch squares, and also attempting to ignore the other girl and the accusation of cheating. The interaction, the conversation, is not confined to vocalization and gesture. References made to the physical environment with glances uh, to the hopscotch squares, for example, under discussion. Joint attention uh, is broken when one girl looks away. So that suggests that uh, the accomplishment of meaning involves two-way interaction. It's not under the control of just one individual. The interaction itself is important here. And in another moment, Carla stomps her foot in one gesture uh, that hits three semiotic points at once, where Diana is looking on the hopscotch square in question and on the object that she is iterating in speech. Okay, so I would say that there is in this setting a complex integration of primary and secondary intersubjective capacities situated within a pragmatic and social context that is both supplemented with and supporting communicative processes. We can think of all that kind of rich description that Kukla, uh, 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 for example, gave of the Speech Act um, uh, earlier on. I wanna suggest that with this example, we can start to push the analysis further and frame some aspects of social cognition in terms of an embodied speech act theory. That is a, a broad view of speech acts embedded uh, in rich contexts of embodied interaction. So here, uh, let me just turn to a question about theories and methods. If the interaction uh, theory is right, if, if if this kind of analysis of the interaction that we've just seen in that example uh, is right, then Carla and Diana are not engaging in a theory of mind process, trying to mind read one another. Uh, you know, it's pretty pretty much out there. What's being what's what's happening? It's out there in the environment. It's in the speech. It's in the gestures. It's all. There's nothing hidden, really, that they have to worry about uh, uh, in, in trying to understand one another. Uh, but, but then the question could be asked, what about Goodwin himself as the scientist trying to understand this interaction? Doesn't he have to employ some kind of mind-reading inferences? Isn't his third-person scientific observations an occasion for inferring what must be going on in the minds of Carla and Diana, right? Carla believes that Diana has cheated and so forth and so on. 
And that would be based upon obs the observational evidence. Or is his scientific analysis really an, uh, an interpretation based on speech act theory, taken in the widest possible sense, uh, considering the, the full communicative practice, plus using a specific method that gets us to the communicative intentions, therefore not by using theory of mind, but rather by a kind of analysis of interaction. And here, uh, one, one can point to specific methods that can be used in, in such uh, contexts uh, to understand uh, precisely what's going on in something like a conversation and in that kind of uh, setting. Uh, and here, we can point to the use of dynamical systems approaches to analyze multimodal aspects of videoed conversation so that uh, we're, we're talking about speech, but also gesture and posture and environmental contexts, right? Uh, so we're talking really about multimodal aspects um, uh, under study. And uh, here uh, I could point to uh, Scott Kelso's work on coordination dynamics. Also very recent, it just came out, I think about a week ago, <laughs> uh, a nice article about multimodal quantitative pragmatics uh, by uh, Alviar Kello and uh, Rick Dale. And uh, there uh, they use the analogy with degrees of freedom in motor control, which is very uh, complex to look at. And here we're looking at uh, yeah, very complex types of processes in real time. Um, and we need a kind of dynamical kind of analysis of, of this to, to understand what's happening or what's going on. So uh, in these types of approaches, a coordination patterns of the different pragmatic modes, speech, gesture, facial expression, posture, movement, et cetera, observed in the conversation emerge from interactions across multiple timescales and are modulated by multiple situational constraints, including the limitations and capabilities of individual brains and bodies, the affordances of a given situation, the goals of interaction, the local culture, the normative constraints, and so forth uh, within any particular setting. Uh, so the, these types of analyses are trying to look at all of those things, but what they're not looking at really uh, is anything like you know, what is the hidden belief of, of the person in this type of situation? So uh, to see this, uh, let me just offer one uh, more example, uh, an ethnographic study of adult social cognitive con uh, context, one that is relatively more obscure simply because of uh, the cultural differences that uh, we all might not share. Uh, but it's an example of interaction uh, to show that one might revert to theory of mind only if one is lacking a sophisticated speech act theory. So here I'm thinking about some work by Tempest Hemming, uh, some recent work, providing uh, an example of conversational interaction, a, of, a set of speech acts that can be analyzed as forming communications fully embedded in a particular cultural style. And specifically here, uh, the style is uh, African-American language and verbal tradition. This style is characterized by specific uh, uh, tr traditional structures, such as uh, what is called indirection, a form of circu uh, circumlocution rather than direct statement. Uh, in the case of indirection, one does not say what one means. One rather takes a circuitous approach to an, an issue in a way that indicates what one thinks. So here is a description of indirection. Uh, it's not just a speech event in African-American communities, but a rhetorical strategy or tactic employed during the daily ritual of communicating as a strategy uh, it is a rhetorical uh, method for attacking and handling communication behaviors. Therefore, uh, as a concept, indirection 
implies something about how African-Americans understand what is appropriate cultural discourse uh, conduct. Also, uh, part of this is called signifying, uh, a technique of indirectly speaking about someone or something using exaggeration, irony, or coded message, where you read between the lines. Uh, and it may involve insults uh, or put down, for example. Uh, you're using language playfully, uh, creatively to comment on or to challenge societal norms and power structures. There's a use of uh, double entendre, the wordplay puns, other rhetorical devices to subvert dominant narratives and communicative resistance or dissent. Uh, here's Henry Louis Gates' description. Signify, he says, can mean the propensity to talk around a subject, never quite coming to the point. It can mean making fun of a person or situation. He points out that it also can denote speaking with the hands and eyes. And in this respect, encompasses a whole complex of expressions and gestures. Thus, it is signifying uh, to stir up a fight between neighbors by telling stories. It is signifying to make fun of a policeman by parody parodying his uh, motion, uh, motions behind his back. Uh, and it's signifying to ask for a piece of cake by saying, my brother needs a piece of cake. Um, examples uh, include something like a game called playing the dozens, a practice where participants seek to outdo each other by throwing insults back and forth. Uh, here's an example from Tom Kochman. Your mama sent her picture to the Lonely Hearts Club, but they sent it back and said, we ain't that lonely. So these little jokes are, you know, back and forth, uh, and one tries to outdo the other. Uh, or something called loud talking when a person says something about someone just loud enough for that person to hear, but indirectly, so he cannot properly respond. The interlocutors in the conversation are practicing uh, indirection and signification. And the communicative uh, participants have a particular performative know-how that allows them to grasp what is going on based on what the speaker is saying, um, how they are moving their body, who else can hear, and so forth and so on. No theory of mind is needed in these kinds of contexts because what is meant is just what is accomplished in the performance, and it's out there to be grasped. So to get at these culturally specific communicative intentions, scientifically, the analysis needs to be holistic to include uh, you know, who is saying it, how something is said, the intonation, for example, to whom it is directed, who can hear, what their bodily gestures and facial expressions are, and the passion and the emotion expressed in the rhetorical style and so forth. So the the scientific, scientific observer is armed with a method and a knowledge of African-American language and verbal tradition that allows her to analyze the speech acts. But me and you, if we are not participating in this, and if we don't have the know-how or the scientific knowledge, perhaps all we're left with is theory of mind. But then I would ask how far would that actually get us in this type of situation? So what I'm suggesting is that to participate in such things, you, you don't need theory of mind. And to do the science, you need something other than theory of mind. You need methods and a specialized kind of knowledge. Okay, so thank you very much. Thanks so much. Okay. Excellent. Uh, thank uh, you, Mr. We move on to Q and A. Yeah, I'll uh, stop sharing my screen here, so I can see you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, You're still there. Great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're we're all here. Uh, we've got a, a couple of questions. Uh, first, uh, Susanna, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Sean. Fascinating. What a fascinating lecture. Can you hear me well? Just... Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
it's not much of a question, but more um comments or two two comments. Um, yeah, it was such a rich uh, presentation. So, uh, one thing I want to start with at the end, the point you make about um to do science, you need something else than theory of mind, and the method could involve uh, multimodal aspects of the ex you know for the experimenter. You might be interested. Uh, I just had the pleasure of seeing uh, Lampos Malafouris give a talk on his oh. new uh, research tool. He calls it perspectival kinesthetic imagining. And uh, I'm not going to be uh, promoting it here, but it was very interesting to learn that he has this whole project where they try to study how the potter is imagining what his next, well, imagining what, what he's next going to and kind of achieve by by having like a whole team of people who are who are looking at photography, then video, then somebody else is drawing his hand gestures, and they have mobile eye tracking. So they're actually trying to implement something like the second person understanding into the scientific methodology of understanding how oh. the process of going about of you know, making the, the pottery is made. Now, I just thought that would be a very nice link or oh. example of what you already said. Yeah. And then yeah. I... Go, go ahead. <laughs> so then I just have like, um, it's, it's not a question, it's just um, a thought about your um, your exposition and um, um when you when you when you said that um uh, you're you're of course opposing this Kukla and Lance's distinction between thinking being private, but agreeing that speaking is public, you said that the inactive way will be to make speech acts more embodied. And I was just wondering at that moment whether or not the point you were also making actually was that maybe we should be making thinking more situated. And I, I saw more of a, like a logical argument going that direction. So uh, if you agree with Merleau-Ponty that speech acts accomplish thoughts, and you agreed with Goodwin that speech acts constitute thoughts, and then if those speech acts are really situated, like you agree with Kukla and Lance, then, then thought would be situated, right? And Sure, yeah. Sure, yeah. So so I guess just, it's a very kind of a small or technical point, maybe, but I was wondering, saying things like making thought, you know, thought is more situated. Does that, is that the same thing as, say, as saying that speech acts are embodied? And what would be the relationship between promoting this very, very situated aspect of thinking as opposed to something, you know, this very mm. strong embodied proposal, since we know that in foreign cognition, sometimes embodiment and situatedness or embeddedness are distinguished so i guess just that was yeah. just a very small you know no it's, no it's i think it's a good uh, question to think about though and um i suppose when i say uh making speech acts more embodied uh i kind of also include uh making them more situated um so i don't i don't think i uh, I mean, and there is, of course, a narrow sense to take embodiment to to just mean, well, we have to make sure we link them up with the gestures and the postures and and facial expressions and all that. Uh, but I think, it, it, you know, as Goodwin uh, shows, it's it's also the situation um, that seems important. And uh, yeah, Kukla and Lance also describe it in just those ways. And I think their <laughs> their descriptions, although they're kind of pushing themselves away from speech acts to more internal idea of thinking, the descriptions of the speech acts are very rich and uh, in, in, in agreement uh, with, with this more embodied or situated uh, way. But, uh, you know, in the end, I don't think I want to make a big distinction between, you know, being embodied and being situated. So I, I kind of embrace the four E's uh, that would be, that would include the extended mind idea to some extent. Yeah, thanks. If I can add to that, I mean, I, I already know your work and I know you 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 integrate these proposals very well. And so it was just really interesting to learn the, the history. The first part of your presentation was great, where we see that we go from Ryle through Sellers, through Austin to Marlo Ponty, right? Saying that speech accomplished, that thinking is accomplished in actions. And I thought, oh, that's just like going back all the way to Ryle again, in a way. 
it seems that was kind no. of the same idea. But so so sellers is problem, and maybe many people might feel pro have a problem with thinking. Um, you know, how how is it that my thinking is? Can it be situated? I mean, everybody wants to talk about something like internalization, right? And yeah. therefore, maybe the way to explain, sorry, the way how, um, instead of talking about internalization, then we should look at really how these processes are properly embodied. And I thought maybe that's the way to, to connect the situatedness of thought to embodiment. What would you think about that? Yeah, I think that's that's probably right. Um, yeah, it's, so it's, you know, there are there is certainly a way to think about thinking as being a kind of internal process that we we don't we don't see everything there is in the mind right so we we can think that we we do sometimes have private thoughts uh but uh i think uh, maybe to also realize that even what we're calling private thoughts are derivative in some way from the more socially uh contextualized types of interactions that we've been engaged in right we don't we just don't invent thoughts out of thin air you know they they are things that um uh, that that we are able to uh operate with because uh we've we've learned them from others and so forth and so on um but uh and there's certainly a way you could think of like something like an intention a distal intention you know that we we form an intention to do something and then we do it and we can see what we're doing but uh, maybe we don't see the intention um but uh it's it's clear that we uh, you know i you know i would argue and some people have already talked about a kind of direct perception that we we do pick up uh perceptually on what what an intention is a, a lot of it has to do with how we define things like intention or emotion and if we define those things as having kind of uh, external manifestations, then we we are able to to perceive them, uh, and they're not fully uh, internal. Let's say. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much to both. And we have a question from the room. Sandra, please go ahead. And she'll be up here in a second. Okay. So thank you so much for your talk. Um, it's not going to be that much of a question. It's just more like a clarification. So going back to the situation of Carla and um, uh, the other girl and the way that they were uh, engaging in, uh, in that interaction, but also um, in the case of a mother and, uh, and an infant, right? So in this situation, uh, would you say that um, the person's attempt to make sense of um, uh, of the other, it's somehow not reducible to um, each each other's observations about the other, right? So perhaps, uh, what would be the best way to um, to account for their interaction? Should we look at, at them as some sort of a um, coupled uh, interactive system, or should we uh, account for it in a in a different way if we are trying to make sense of it without? Uh, engaging into into that particular situation, like like you mentioned from a third person uh, perspective, because it seems to be more like a second uh, a second person um, based kind of um, mm -hmm. intersubjective interaction. Yeah, I think so. I mean, one can I think one can make a, a distinction anyway between uh, kind of second person interaction and third person observation, um, and uh, I think the second person interaction uh, is uh, is precisely is something that uh, uh, that uh, in which uh, uh, some you know a kind of system emerges uh, a coupled uh, let's say where uh, two people are coupled in the right way in in terms of their conversation in terms of their interaction. And what emerges is something like a system that that uh, manifests uh, certain characteristics that go beyond any one of them, right? So meaning emerges from this whole uh, this kind of coupling. So I think that's right. And uh, you know, if you think of those things in dynamical terms, and if you try to analyze them using these kind of dynamical methods, 
uh, you can you can at least uh, capture some of of the complexity of it and all of the the multimodal aspects of it as well, including the situate the the situation, the environmental uh, aspects that seem to contribute to to this. And if you you can think of this also in terms of um, experiments where if you intervene and you know take one of those elements away, you can see what changes. Uh, so uh, the the uh, experiment by Trevarthen where you know they do the video camera, what you're taking away is just the contingency and what you find is a completely different type of interaction or uh, a different type of response on the infant's part that happens. You could imagine taking away the gesture. So uh, what happens if you, if you were not able to gesture in these kind of encounters? And you would find a changed dynamic. Or if you were not able to speak, <laughs> you would find a, a very changed dynamic. So you, you can do experiments, I think, uh, to to try to demonstrate what the dynamics of of that kind of coupled system um, amounts to. And uh, I think it's, yeah, that's a good way to think of it. Thanks. Thanks. All right. And... Uh... Some, if there are some more questions or comments, rejoinders, um, and if not, let me, um, this is going to be very half-baked. Uh, uh, thanks so much for, for, for your talk. So I'm gonna ask maybe two very short things, and if you think they're too lofty, just don't answer them. Okay. Um, so um, one of them is this, and sort of let's, let's, let's use this as a salvo. I was trying to um, uh, listen to, um, much of your talk with the year of a uh, Cartesian materialist or something of this sort. So um, the question is, uh, boring the blunt statements, we don't need Tom for this or uh, something like that. They could agree with pretty much everything you're saying, right? And, and so I was just wondering if there's a further step to be made there or if you're just thinking that's explanatorily idle or something like that. Yeah, I do. Um, they, in some sense, I mean, just in, if you just consider the the question of uh, uh, embodiment and the materiality uh, involved, uh, then I suppose they could agree with everything. But then, normally, uh, the, the theorists who take that that kind of position uh, somehow or other uh, still want to talk about inferences and theory of mind, uh, maybe maybe even in terms of subpersonal processes. Um, Peter Carruthers, for example, would say, yeah, sure, you, you know, all of this makes sense, but you still need to, uh, to consider um, a kind of, uh, you know, to explain what's happening, you need subpersonal processes such as inference uh, and a kind of theory of mind mechanism working in the brain and so forth. Um, and that's, I guess, where I want to disagree. So it just depends on, you know, how one takes their Cartesian materialism and what direction and so forth. Right. And, and I guess uh, sort of um, uh, one way to look at that would have been uh, whether, uh, you know, when, when you uh, um, read that uh, quote from Megaloponti as, as saying that uh, speech constitutes thought, uh, uh, that, uh, Obviously, you know, why not speech occasions thought, speech causes us to think, et cetera, right? So, so the constitution bit, there was, um, there seemed to be a kind of metaphysical baggage to it that, right, yeah. uh, right, right. So maybe that's, uh, that's, they were one, uh, one uh, point where they would certainly uh, differ. Uh, yeah. Right, um, I, I guess, so, so that's, that's out of the way. Um, is, there, hmm. is there time for one more brief question or? Um, so I'm I'm wondering. Um, so um, I'm wondering exactly what we should get. Um, um, uh, this is maybe a follow up to what Susanna was asking earlier about the connection between um, uh, an embodied view of speech act theory, uh, and on the one hand, and on the other hand, the idea that speech might constitute thought, right? Uh, so. Uh, uh, just a uh, hard back to uh, 
uh, uh, the old days, right, where uh, Grice would differ from Austin, um, uh, right? If, if you have somebody uh, pretending uh, to go through the exact same motions with the exact same gestures and the exact same intonation and so on, but really be meaning to be sending a wholly different message, right? Um, it seems as though um, uh, the embodied part of the communicative act uh, doesn't, in some sense, tell the whole story to the extent that pretense could fully feign it, right? Um, and, and so I wonder, um, is there, does that mark some kind of distance between the um, embodied speech act theory view and uh, uh, the view that speech constitutes thought? Or um, is, could this finally somehow be accounted for by various uh, analyses of conversational context and so on? So I just wonder what you think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, definitely it's, uh, so it's more than just the bodily movements that are you know, involved, right? Context does does do a lot of this. And um, I'm not, uh, you know, so this, this idea of interaction theory doesn't deny that there are some cases, uh, and it's just the claim is that they are more rare than we usually think of them, where something like theory of mind uh, might be um, operative. So, we, you know, we might be puzzled by somebody's behavior, and then we we try to figure it out uh, by inferring what must be going on in their head or whatever like that. Um, so I think there, uh, and there are, you know, other kinds of contexts like in therapy or something like that, where maybe maybe certain aspects of of that kind of inferential process is is working. So. Um, the idea is not to deny that there are special cases where a theory of mind might work, and and after a while, if you know, if you start to think that someone is uh, being dishonest with you uh, or trying to fool you or whatever, you you might get into that kind of uh, perspective of, of trying to figure out what why and so forth. The but that tends that tends to be a more reflective type of process, a kind of uh, um, a uh, something that uh, sort of is looking back at the interaction rather than something that is accomplished in the interaction itself. And uh, the uh, that kind of reflective, retrospective looking and trying to explain or trying to justify, of course, leads to uh, our use of these terms that constitute uh, folk psychology. Um, so uh, Merleau-Ponty's uh, phrase is that uh, speech accomplishes thought. He doesn't say constitutes, right? Uh, I think I did say constitute. But then on, uh, so for uh, an activist thinker, is the question is, what does constitution mean? And then that's another discussion. Eh? And it, it's not it's not that uh, they, they would uh, necessarily... Uh, accept the strict division between causal versus constitution that you get in that kind of claim that you know they're 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 involved in a fallacy uh, about making such strong claims about constitution. But that's again that will be another another discussion. Right, and and so just just to make sure I I I, uh, I understand that the, the thought the thought is that if this is a retrospective and reflective, it's not really uh, perhaps affecting the interaction in question, in the there and then, right? Yeah, so, right. Okay. Yeah, so I think theory of mind is this kind of reflective thing, and you know, talking about mental states like beliefs, even my own belief and so forth, that's a kind of reflective thing which comes up after the fact, uh, in a sense. Uh, but but it's not necessarily there in the in the original kind of process or, or the interaction. Right, great. Thank you so much. Please. Uh, oh, before we uh, we stop, we have a new question from Martina. Uh, if we may abuse you some more, so Martina, <laughs> go ahead. Please. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's more of a finger than a hand. <laughs> so it's just ah. a follow up to the to the previous one. Um, yes, so I, I was just thinking about this theory of mind as a way of kind of a reflective process, you know, that's happening afterwards. So I guess in an activist framework, we would put it on the level of like co-regulation of the interaction, right? So not interacting, but this co-regulation that's coming. Would that make sense? Hmm, it could, yeah. Not, not that it 
that is uh, uh, frequent or you know always happening uh, as a uh, in that sense. But but if if it does happen, then yeah, a kind of co-regulation. That, you know, you back up and, and then you engage again, I suppose. Uh, so with with some adjustments. So if that's what you mean, I think. That, yes, yeah, yes, exactly. Thank you. That makes sense. That's terrific. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Professor Gallagher. Thank you all. And, um, I'm not sure if you could hear that, but there are a couple of folks here in the room. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>